Good afternoon and welcome to A House Divided, coming to you live from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. If it's on our shelves, it's history. My name is Bjorn Skaptison and I am your host for this afternoon's live interview, or rather, I should say, this evening's live interview uh, with uh, Dr. Elizabeth, Elizabeth R. Varen, uh, who is coming to us from the United Kingdom tonight. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Uh, this is the pub date of my book, and I can't think of a better way to, to roll it out than uh, a program with, with you guys, given all you do to promote Civil War scholarship. It's very much appreciated uh, well, by readers and readers and writers alike out here. Thank you very much, Dr. Varen. We'll get back to uh, we'll get back to this in just a minute because there's some some more questions I want to ask you. Um, but first, let me introduce. Uh, first, let me give you some uh, some ground rules for everyone who's watching. Uh, what 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 this discussion is about. The first thing I think I want everybody who's watching this to remember. Everybody who's watching this out there on the Facebook live stream. Uh, Sure, you're going to watch me, Bjorn Skaptison, and Dr. Elizabeth Varen discuss her book about James Longstreet, but what you are watching is a book signing. What you are attending is a live book signing on the date of release for Longstreet, the Confederate general who defied the South. You're watching a book signing, and I'm going to provide you with a link in the comments that will permit you to buy a signed first edition copy of Longstreet, the Confederate general who defied the South. It's a first edition copy, which Dr. Varen has very generously signed our custom Abraham Lincoln Bookshop book plates. Uh, you order it while you're watching and we will send it to you. So it's not just a discussion. It's not just a discussion, it's a book signing. You get to join the conversation just as if we were at the corner bookshop down the, down the street from where you live. There. Uh, but today is an international book signing coming to you from the United Kingdom. Uh, That's right. And Chicago. And we are going to be, let me introduce you to your author today. Uh, our guest is Professor Elizabeth R. Varon. And she is the Langburn M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia and a member of the Executive Council of UVA's John L. Now III Center for Civil War History, a center that is doing remarkable things in the study and interpretation of Civil War history. Uh, maybe we'll get to that in just a moment. The book is Longstreet, the Confederate General Who Defied the South. There is the dust jacket right there. Let me give you, let me give everybody a closer look of the dust jacket. Longstreet, the Confederate general who defied the South. It comes to you from Simon & Schuster Publishers, who we thank for putting us together with Dr. Varon. Published on this day, November 21st, 2023, 459 pages. It's illustrated, comes in the dust jacket. It costs $35, and you will order it, and we'll send it right out to you. If you order it now, it'll be easy for you to get it in time to give it as a gift, or rather, to give the second copy you bought as a gift, the other one you kept yeah. for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, once again, Elizabeth Farron, welcome to A House Divided. And thank you so much time for, for making time six hours in advance uh, where you are in the United Kingdom. Tell us a little bit about why you're uh, visiting us from- uh, Yeah, UK so I, I teach at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Uh, home for me. I grew up in Virginia, uh, taught at many places, but ended up coming home to Virginia to teach. Uh, and I am this year, uh, I have the, the distinct pleasure and honor of being a visiting professor at Oxford University in Oxford, uh, England, um, in, a, in a, a chair that is uh, that they uh, use an endowed chair to bring an American historian to their campus every every year to participate in their various American history teaching and programming. And of course, it's been absolutely fascinating this ancient city ancient university I, we think of uva my school as being old by american standards but these guys have us have a speed on that on that uh, uh, account uh, for sure and and it's been uh, you know surrounded by history here uh, and and it's been a great great uh, great visit so far wonderful wonderful yeah and we were talking earlier that you were you had some um, 
uh, U.S. history classes and courses you're teaching, and plenty of British, I suspect, uh, mostly students of U.S. history. Yeah, and they're fascinated in our Civil War, just as Americans are, and and uh, and interested in you know both drawing parallels to episodes in their own history, but also appreciating the distinctiveness of, of our of our Civil War and the way that we all are still talk about it. And it resonates in our modern life. That's something that really, really uh, interests them a great deal. Right. It was an international war. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, let's get straight. Uh, let's get right into your brand new book, uh, Longstreet, the Confederate General Who Divided the South. Well, I was reading my review copy, getting preparing diligently for this conversation, reading it, my favorite place to read a book during my favorite hour to read a book, the happiest hour of the day. And um, and uh, one of my compatriots, a, a woman leaned over to me on the bar stool and looked at and said, what are you reading? And I said, Longstreet, the Confederate generally defied the South. It's a brand new book about James Longstreet. And she said, who is that? And that reminded me, because of the environment I was in, and this was a well-educated, well-read mm -hmm. person, uh, and, but it reminded me, uh, we live in this little bubble of Civil War history, and there are certain names that just pop out, and everybody knows that, but there are, but here's a book that can introduce this guy, introduce this person, and the subject of the U.S. of U.S. history to anybody who would say, James Longstreet, who's that? What Elizabeth, what would your first elevator pitch be to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I uh, have pitched this book as a story of a man who makes the most dramatic, surprising political about face in American history. There may be a more surprising one. I can't think of one. But um, his political journey is a fascinating window into 19th century America. And just as you say, he's extremely well known to Civil War buffs and aficionados um, in a way. But I would argue that even for the, the uh, you know, the, 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 those in, initiated into this field, there is a long street that we don't know or uh, as nearly as well as we should. And the way to put it maybe is to say, you know, he was a he was a general in the Confederate Army for four years. But after the war, he has a 40 year, nearly 40 year career as a Republican political operative. And we understand those 40 years much less well. They've been much less carefully studied than the war years. Of course, the war itself, 90% uh, of what's been written about the war experience focuses on three days in July of 1863. Um, so part of the goal of this book was to say this political conversion of his, this turnabout where a Confederate embraces the Republican Party and, and, and Reconstruction and suffers ostracism uh, for it and embarks on this political career. This is something that we need to explain. It hasn't really been fully uh, explained uh, before. And, and, and of course, this sets him uh, on a career that begins with some, some very controversial moves during Reconstruction. This is fundamentally a book about, about Reconstruction, but um, it, the, the war also figures centrally. How, how, how couldn't it? Part of the argument of the book is that you, you can't understand the war without understanding what comes after, and you can't understand Reconstruction without understanding the war. That is to say, the, all of the endless litigation and read litigation of his military performance at Gettysburg. Did, is he the scapegoat for the battle? Should he be scapegoated for the battle and for Confederate defeat? All of this is prompted by a political backlash against his political conversion, uh, which happens during Reconstruction. So all of those things fascinated me. I, I'm, I'm someone who lo loves biography, particularly loves biography of surprising people. Uh, you know, dissenters, mavericks who go against the grain. I wrote a biography some years ago about just such a woman named Elizabeth Van Lu, who was a Civil War spy in Richmond, Virginia, for the Union, uh, absolutely sort of went against expectations. Uh, and that kind of figure really fascinates me. And I'll just add to sort of start us off that there's another sense in which I feel we haven't got really known Longstreet as well as we might tell ourselves we do or maybe to put it another way that the, the dominant image is not really 
an accurate one, and that is he has had an image uh, in the public eye of being this sort of gruff man of few words without any particular skills at communication or politics. His political career has been pretty much belittled and derided by his biographers who feel that he was an inept politician. Um, you know, I, I found that he was not a gruff man of few words, that he was a voluble, prolific speaker and writer who loved to lean into an interview, who loved to be asked his opinion, who wrote a 690 page memoir. I know you've got a first mm -hmm. edition of that behind you, and we can use it as a little bit of a prop to show people yeah. just how, <laughs> how much he had to say. Um, but but uh, I also found and, and, and I argue in this book that he was quite a savvy politician. You know, my, my view is that you don't get to be a, a powerful general without having some political skills that that those the, those are required in the army as well as in, in the civilian world. But but he I think he was a more savvy politician than people uh, have recognized. So right. so, um, you know, all of these things were 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 on my mind, he, he left a kind of massive body of work, if you will, in the form of not only dispatches and letters, but speeches and interviews and memoir, the essays he wrote defending his wartime record. And I felt like it deserved a real careful analysis. One of the things I was interested in in this book is to hear his voice. There, you know, there's been some very fine work on Longstreet, but, but, I, but uh, it hasn't, we haven't heard as much of his voice in the existing literature as uh as as we might and the sources make it possible to tune in that sure. voice very clearly because of all he had to say right now one of your previous books we have here and that's armies of deliverance uh which is this is a full history of the civil war uh the subtitle being a new history of the civil war and one of the things that uh that I noticed about Armies of Deliverance, a fine book which I also recommend to our to our viewers, is it it takes when it says a new history of the Civil War, it means it takes this huge topic and looks at all the things we think we know, but looks at it from new perspectives and asks new questions. Did did you feel like any of that uh, newness? sort of carried over to Longstreet? Taking yeah, absolutely. Topic and asking I mean, questions? that's a great question and I appreciate it. Armies of Deliverance is really a study of union war aims fundamentally. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the heart of union war aims was a really strong and resilient belief on the part of Northerners that they needed to deliver the Southern people from the secessionist elite, sort of break the spell that secessionists had cast over the white Southern masses. Uh, and 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 sort of bring them back into the national fold. And one of the arguments Armies of Deliverance makes is that that belief that Southerners could be delivered, that their hearts and minds could be changed, their allegiance to the Union renewed, proved to be really potent. You know, even in the face of massive evidence that that white Southerners didn't didn't want to be, uh, uh, you know, change their hearts and minds and be converted in this way. Um, and, and Longstreet, in a sense, after the war is a powerful symbol of the survival of that, that hope on the part of Northerners that's, uh, uh, that Northerners could change Southern hearts and minds. He is the sort of, uh, you know, poster child once he's embraced Reconstruction for, for, for this, this, uh, this uh, uh, idea of deliverance, uh, in a sense. So that book is connected to the Longstreet book. So, too, is my book uh, on Appomattox about uh, Lee's surrender. Uh, to grant Grant's terms at Appomattox are quite crucial to Longstreet's story uh, as well. And then on the subject of saying something new, uh, you know, uh, to me the a big opportunity in Appomattox and Armies of Deliverance was to was to take conventional battlefield history and really integrate it with what historians call social history or sort of you know uh, life on the ground uh, histories that include civilians, non-combatants. Uh, women and African Americans, uh, enslaved people who are doing all they can to to flee slavery and help the Union Army and so on. So those are all important figures in those other two books. And in this Longstreet book, I wanted to take a similar approach, particularly to center race relations. You know, here's a man, he was a Southerner born and bred, spent most of his life in the South. Uh, his relationship with African Americans, his views of slavery and emancipation, are are fascinating and they're at the heart of his story and yet they they have been overlooked by previous biographers who haven't really asked those questions 
uh, those kinds of questions. So, um, so yeah, there, you know, part of the the moral of the story here, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's it's always worth taking a new look at a seemingly familiar subject. In part because our 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 field changes and evolves and 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 uh, develops, and also because we have new tools at our disposal. You know, as 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 you will know. We've now been able to digitize, and COVID really, really was an accelerator to this, to digitize vast databases of historical sources, which makes it possible to go to a, a newspapers.com type database and type in the word Longstreet and get your thousands of hits. It's no substitute for going into the archives or buying a beautiful first edition book, but, but it does permit you to trace you know, where someone's been and what they've been doing in their, you know, through the press uh, in a way that you, you know, would have taken, you know, a, a lifetime before Absolutely. before we had these tools, you know, Absolutely. and to, sometimes to make connections and so on. So, so yeah, I thought the, the premise of this book is that it is possible to take a new look at this man and to say something new about him. Yeah, if anybody has ever used microfilm to do primary source. Right. Yeah, that research. was a very different that the, was a very different world for sure. Yeah, the hours you would spend to find one article. Absolutely. You, Absolutely. You now, I think uh, there's three distinct long streets to talk about here. Yeah, so we're going to need right. to kind of move quickly right. and uh but one overarching um uh theme I see of the book is that uh, Longstreet's relationships with the people he knew and the people he met and the yeah. people who were close to him are very important to uh, both his life and how he remembered it, how people remembered him, things like that. Now, I know this is coming out of the left field, but this leads us to that that one place that shall not be <laughs> yeah, right. Nice touch. Everywhere. Nice touch, yep. <laughs> This does lead us to Seminary Ridge. Of course. Uh, and that question of, uh, in the you know, maybe in the back half of this conversation, there will be the controversy over what right. Lee and Longstreet did at Gettysburg. But without, we're just going to have to pass over Seven Pines and the victory at Second Manassas. Because as you mentioned before, uh, the key to how he's remembered really does come to those few hours there on Seminary Ridge, uh, July 2nd and 3rd at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, so without getting too much into the controversy, tell us what the source of that is. What's happening yeah, so, at Gettysburg I mean, of course that it's absolutely, gets us you know, to this point later? Yeah, uh, pe people are interested in this for good reason. It's absolutely fascinating. And we don't have to pass too quickly over his early war experiences because they're relevant. You know, the conclusion he draws from from Second Manassas and Fredericksburg, for example, is it's, advantage to, uh, it's advantageous to fight on the tactical defensive. And that's what he hopes Confederates can, can do. So uh, as the Confederate army, you know, moves north in the Gettysburg campaign, uh, 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 and, and he and Lee are talking tactics and strategy. Longstreet believes they have a sort of loose agreement to try to fight on the tactical defensive even as they're launching a strategic offensive, if possible, on ground of their own choosing. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, of course, the Battle of Gettysburg begins to unfold uh, as Lee considers his options for the second day of the battle for July 2nd. He, he proposes a, a, that Longstreet attack a very um, uh, a disadvantageous from the Confederates perspective, disadvantageous, uh, uh, you know, uh, federal uh, uh, position. Uh, Longstreet has a different idea in mind, maybe dislodging the Confederates from, from uh, this, um, these imposing, you know, uh, sort of a Yankee high ground uh, and, and uh, um, you know, moving south around the, around the, uh, the, the Yankees left flank to get them between, uh, you know, get between them and, and D.C. And, and force the Union Army to attack Confederates on, on, on ground of the Confederates choosing a favorable high ground for the Confederates. So Lee waves off this suggestion that attack on the second day um, happens later in the day than Lee would have ideally liked, although Longstreet and, and his defenders will argue that, that the delays happen because Longstreet is looking to improve the Confederates' chances for success by awaiting reinforcements, for example, or taking a route to the battlefield that won't be uh, spied upon by uh, Yankee signal stations and so on. 
uh, at the end of, and of course that that uh, that uh, second day. Uh, is is uh, is is disappointing for the Confederates as the federal line holds as Lee considers his options for the third day. Longstreet is again um, very discouraged when Lee decides to go on the tactical offensive. Uh, and while Longstreet had felt the plan for the second day was misguided, he did feel the plan for the third day was hopeless. So, you know, Pickett's charge. Uh, Pettigrew Trimble, et cetera, that, that, that he would have needed many more men than he had in order for, for what we remember as Pickett's charge to be successful. So Longstreet is, 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 uh, is disappointed. Now, of course, what is the controversy? The controversy is, you know, it, 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 it's a matter of record that Longstreet would have favored some kind of turning movement or, or, or flank attack on day two and day three, and he told Lee so. The controversy is over whether Longstreet's uh, ambivalence about Lee's plan, lack of enthusiasm for it, translated into sabotage, you know, deliberate disobedience, uh, and whether that sabotage and deliberate disobedience costs the Confederates victory on day two and day three. And, you know, many people have weighed in about this, and, 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 uh, you know, my, my own view is, is, uh, a kind of, you know, uh, 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 uh split the difference kind of view that, uh, to be sure, um, Longstreet bears some blame for some mishandling of his of his assignments, insufficient reconnaissance, for example, not doing his, enough to prepare his men, particularly on day two for, uh, for the assault. Um, yes, he was unenthusiastic about Lee's plan and a little hurt that Lee had kind of rushed him off. Um, but was he willfully disobedient? Absolutely not. I see no evidence of that. Was it sabotage? It, was he is he is he is he personally responsible for the loss of the battle? I think the answer is clearly no. Uh, and we know this. You know, this is clear in in a number of ways. First of all, Longstreet's own in the moment reflection suggests that the theme of his Gettysburg was deference to Lee. That he ultimately yielded to Lee and to Lee's plans, although he had uh, doubts about them. Um, and and he had moments where he could have, uh, you know, in effect, registered a protest by 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 taking up Hood's suggestion on the second day uh, to modify the battle plan, for example. But but he doesn't. He says, no, we have Lee's orders. We must yield to Lee. So his theme of his own recollections is deference, at least initially. Um, we know that there was plenty of blame to go around, uh, mm -hmm. and and this is you know Lee certainly felt that his principal commanders hadn't played well together during this this campaign, but he was much more inclined to blame Ewell or Stewart than, than Longstreet. There's no, you know, many people, Hill, Ewell and Stewart can all come in for, for uh, you know, blame, if you want to, you know, use sure. that word. Um, uh, uh, there's no reason to assign most of it to Longstreet. Then finally, to me, most interestingly, you know, where this bears most on, on my main questions about his political transformation after the war is that at the time, the Confederate press and public did not scapegoat Longstreet. They did not see him as the principal, uh, the principal, uh, you know, uh, failure. Um, his reputation as Lee's war horse, Lee's right-hand man, the second most important Confederate in the Confederate army, um, was intact at the end of Gettysburg. And that should tell us something. And what it tells us is that this attack on his wartime record really builds up steam after the fact, post facto, uh, when it is tied to uh, uh, the, the disapproval of those Lee acolytes early in Pendleton and others, disapproval of the political course he's taken. Right. And I think, yeah, to go ahead and slide into, since we've covered Gettys, but we slide, in, slide into the controversy now, if there's a little more to say about it. One of the things I took from the book uh, that I had not thought about before is that when Jubal Early gets up and starts taking swipes at General Longstreet over Gettysburg, he's not talking about a general. He's talking about a politician. Mm -hmm. And when Early or Pendleton comes up with these post facto criticisms of Longstreet at Gettysburg and that because of what Longstreet did at Gettysburg, the whole war was lost. The whole cause was lost. They are talking about a political opponent. A hundred percent. Not genuinely about a 
history. Yeah, and and there's some you know there's some even even the the, the Longstreet's modern detractors will concede, for example, that one of their claims that Lee had issued a sunrise order for an attack on July second at sunrise is just not it's just not 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 true. Mm -hmm. So yes, so the timing, you know, so early in Pendleton begin to really attack Longstreet 1872 1873. Why? Well, that's the height of Longstreet's career and visibility as a Republican operative. And of course, what do we mean by Republican operative at, at this moment? Um, you know, the Republican party is the party of Lincoln, a reform-minded anti-slavery political party, the party of emancipation, the party of the Northern war effort, the party of union victory, a party that represents everything Confederates had been taught they should loathe and fear. Uh, and so, so for Longstreet to to uh, in 1867, as Congress is implementing a program for reconstruction that will overturn the disastrous program of Andrew Johnson, as Longstreet steps forward and says, "Hey, we 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 ought to try to work with the Republicans. We, we you know the, the the Union fought the war. We said we have this conflict. We're gonna we're gonna appeal to the sword as arbit you know to arbitrate it. And guess what? You know the the Union won. And so now we have to try to live in the world." that their victory has has created, he is savage by ex-Confederates. I mean, the, the commentary, and it surprises him, you know, because he believes he's taking a very pragmatic position. Uh, how else is there going to be peace if if some white Southerners don't step forward and say we're going to we're going to work with the victors? Um, but he is, you know, ex-Confederates call him Judith. Judas and Lucifer and 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 uh, Benedict Arnold and they say too bad he didn't die of his wounds in the wilderness that would have been better uh, than seeing him uh, you know become uh, an apostate as they saw it yeah uh, we are at a point where I want to check and see if we have any questions and we don't have too much going on as questions right now so if you folks out there are watching come up with any questions or comments, let us know. I do have a couple that I want to share with you here, Elizabeth. Sure. And, uh, one of them is uh, uh, Dennis Meyer, pastor. Uh, and we've kind of already answered this, but I want to make sure we shout out to Dennis here. Dennis wants to know why didn't Lee really listen to his old war horse Longstreet before Pickett's charge? Uh, I mean, do you have anything yeah, to so add as far as what Dennis is getting at here? I mean, I think I think that's a great question. Uh, and there's been en endless speculation about that. And, and you know, one answer is that Lee had a, a, a supreme confidence in his troops, perhaps an overconfidence in his troops. A second answer is that he underestimated Meade. And, and you could understand why he'd underestimate Meade, because he'd had the better of every other commander of the Army of the Potomac, and they, they, they'd often bungled and and he you know hoped and and assumed that that uh that that would be the case again but you know the most interesting way to attack this question is to ask what did longstreet say about why lee you know waved him off and and longstreet um initially uh didn't have much to say early in pendleton and others who began to attack his war record in the early 1870s were trying to kind of bait him into a debate and he didn't take the bait at first but eventually after you know endless attacks he did and what in his memoir he offers the strongest language uh, uh that's critical of lee in which he says lee ordered those attacks because he was off his game. He he had lost his equipoise, as Longstreet put it, in a kind of 19th century flourish. His, his balance, his bloodlust was up. And that that kind of, I'm paraphrasing, but that kind of language was something that Lee's, Lee's supporters could never fit, forgive Longstreet for. Mm -hmm. But Longstreet made these criticisms of Lee, of Lee having acted somewhat irrationally, he, he made these criticisms in his memoir while also comparing Lee to Grant and comparing Lee to Grant unfavorably, saying Grant ultimately was the superior general because Grant had this cool. Grant didn't lose his equipoise. Grant wasn't thrown off by, by, by passions, you know, and that, that ultimately uh, uh, made him, you know, made him the, 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 the superior uh, uh, you know, tactician and, and strategist. Longstreet's memoir develops 
a theme that again goes to your questioner's question, and that is, you know, Longstreet never lost his faith in the Confederate cause. You know, some of his detractors will say, well, he he, you know, through the Battle of Gettysburg and he became a Republican because his heart was never in the Confederate cause to begin with. That that's not right. He was not aloof from the Confederacy. His heart was very much in the cause. But he did become discouraged over the course of the war by a lot of things. He became discouraged by Confederate logistical woes. He felt his men were chronically undersupplied. He became frustrated by, you know, infighting and and uh and and tactical miscalculations and so on. But what sort of discouraged him most was what he felt, what he came to feel was the fatal flaw of the Confederacy. And that was, as he put it, the flaw of hubris. He felt that the Confederates again and again underestimated their opponents, that this was a factor at Gettysburg. And, and, and he, his warning issued more than once to his fellow Confederates was, uh, and he began to issue this warning really when he's in the Western theater with, with Grant, uh, you know, was was you better not underestimate Grant because this is a man who will who will make Confederates pay for their dysfunction in a way that no other Union commander has 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 been able to do. So so um, you know, there are tactical and strategic reasons that Lee decided uh, the way he did at, at Gettysburg, but Longstreet's focus was on this kind of psychology, you know, and and you can accept it or not, but this Longstreet believed that Lee was off his off his game at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that brings us to, we're about halfway through our conversation, that brings us to, to me, this was a wonderful surprise, but it brings us to the halfway point in Longstreet. You see my uh, bookmark there. That's Appomattox. Yeah. Uh, we have reached Appomattox and we're halfway through the book. And to me, that is one of the real uh, real draws of this book. And for the folks at home, Elizabeth said this earlier in our conversation, but this does tell the story of not one other, but at least two other long streets right. that you've never heard about. And so once you get to Appomattox, first of all, I was surprised. Okay, here's a Civil War biography and I have half the book to go. And then I was really eager to turn the next page and find out, okay, well, what happens after Appomattox? What happens, what happens next? And what did happen next, again, we just talked about the relationship between Lee and Longstreet. What happens next has a lot to do with the personal relationship between Longstreet and Grant. Absolutely. Uh, and so, so let's, with that in mind, let's take us to that next chapter. Appomattox occurs. We have Grant's, uh, uh, we have Grant's, um, uh, generous terms of surrender. And if you want to cover that, please do. But also now we have a world where the Confederates are cast loose. They're not Confederates anymore. Uh, your colleague Caroline Janey has written about that uh, uh, within the last, last couple of years. And so now Longstreet, uh, both James and Louise Longstreet have a problem as far as how do they get back to being normal citizens? How do they get that pardon? What's standing in the way? And how does the relationship with Grant, uh, what does that have to do with Longstreet solving his problem after the war? It has everything to do with it, just as, as you've said. You know, as you've noted, there are these figures who loom large in Longstreet's life when he was a young man, his surrogate father, a, a man named Augustus Baldwin Longstreet, who was a quite a fervent pro-slavery ideologue uh, is a big political influence on him. Uh, uh, his relationship with Lee, very, very complicated wartime uh, relationship that sat really sours after the war. His relationship with Grant is perhaps the central one. They were best buddies at West Point, served together in the Mexican War. Their families were friends. Their uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, wives were friends. Um, obviously, the war disrupts that, but Grant does issue these magnanimous terms at Appomattox. The two men have a have a reunion in which Grant is very warm to Longstreet, and Longstreet, you know, comes away from Appomattox feeling that Grant has just demonstrated, uh, uh, you know, his character, his 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 moral stature, as uh, you know, that goes along with his military stature. 
And Longstreet in, interprets those generous terms of grants. The grants terms were intended to affect Confederate uh, atonement and repentance and gratitude and submission and compliance. Uh, 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 you know, again, bring the errant brethren back into the fold. Um, Longstreet interprets those terms through the lens of his friendship with Grant, and he and he interprets them as Grant intended them. I'm glad you brought up the book by my my brilliant colleague Harry Janey about uh, uh, called "The Ends of War" about uh, the Army of Northern Virginia yeah. in the last days of the war, because one of the points she makes is that the vast majority of Confederates did not interpret the terms in the way Longstreet did. Many of them went home, sort of, ex she puts it, expecting a renewed call to battle, thinking the war, uh, hoping the war wasn't over at all. But Longstreet takes Grant's offer to heart. So in exchange for your clemency, I now have to have to turn the page, you know? So um, yes, Longstreet he moves to, to, war to New Orleans after the war. He has to build a new life for his family. His family's very much on his mind. They've had a tragic civil war. He and his wife lost three young children in the space of a week in the winter of 1862 to scarlet fever. That just cast a, a shadow over his entire war. And he's trying to figure out sort of what to do next. He seeks a pardon from Andrew Johnson, doesn't, doesn't get it. He eventually will be, his political disabilities uh, will be removed and all of his you know, rights to vote and hold office restored by, by Congress. Uh, um, uh, according to the provisions of the 14th Amendment, which we're now debating in the Trump context some. Um, so he has to decide how to make a fresh start. And he sort of looks around the landscape and, you know, what are his choices? You have got Jefferson Davis, who doesn't seem to realize the war is over. He's still very defiant. You have Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, who has been excessively lenient to former Confederates and enabled them to come back into power and, and reimpose something very much like slavery on freed people. You have the Southern Democratic Party, which seems to now want to keep fighting the war by political means. And here's Longstreet. What he wants is peace. He wants peace for his family and prosperity and serenity and security for his family. And, and, and he thinks, well, you know, who do I choose that will give me that peace? Am I going to trust Andrew Johnson, a sort of volatile drunkard, or am I going to trust U.S. Grant, mm -hmm. my dear old friend, magnificent general, man who never seems to lose his cool, man of honor, man of graciousness and generosity, and he decides he'll throw in his lot with Grant. So he writes these famous letters to the local paper in New Orleans in which he he explains why he thinks Southerners ought to give Congress's plan for reconstruction a try. Now, what makes that so controversial is con the centerpiece of Congress's plan for reconstruction is black voting, the enfranchisement of men who had been enslaved in the South, African-American men, uh, as the core of a new, a new uh, governing, interracial governing coalition uh, in the South under the Republican Party. And Longstreet says, yes, let's give black suffrage a try. This is anathema to the to the vast majority of ex-Confederates. And then, you know, so one of the challenges of the book was to explain why. So we've talked already in passing about two factors, the friendship with Grant and Longstreet's desire to find peace for his family after it's been battered the way it has in the war. As a, a third factor, and this is something that has really been overlooked by his biographers, although it comes out some in some interesting books about uh, about Reconstruction, is the New Orleans setting in which he settles down after the war is a kind of character in this story. P part of the point of my book is to say, when we think Longstreet, we shouldn't only think Gettysburg, we should also th think Appomattox and New Orleans. Yes, and New absolutely. Orleans is so important because there is this, this uh, quite distinct uh, free Black a mixed race, Afro-Creole uh, so-called class of men who have, have uh, Spanish and, and French lineage uh, going back many decades uh, in, in the region, um, uh, men who have been officers in the Union Army during a brief experiment in, in, in letting uh, uh, appointing Black commissioned officers to USCT regiments during the war. They're a very confident uh, 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 ambitious uh, leadership class, men like PBS Pinchback, Mm -hmm. um, who will uh, become a acting governor of Louisiana, uh, a, a state senator, and so on, himself a Union veteran. And Longstreet is, is, comes to be impressed by these guys, and, 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 he, and, he, and he works with them. Um, to, uh, uh, he becomes leader of the interracial state militia in Louisiana. 
And so much of this dynamic has to do with the fact that while Confederates reacted to Longstreet's letter saying, hey, let's give Reconstruction and Black voting a chance with just absolute furor, Republicans welcomed him and were let it, willing to sort of let him finesse the issue of loyalty. Their, their, their position was, yeah, Longstreet was a Northern Republicans, I mean here, of course, but also uh, some some uh, 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 you know Southern ones, Black, and, and then a small number of white Southern Republicans welcomed him saying, you know, yes, he was a great Confederate general. The greater a general he was, the more important a symbol he is of right. repentance. You know, so 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 he gets a the warm welcome he gets from the Republicans and the the you know back of the hand he gets from ex Confederates just motivates him to double down on this commitment to the Republican Party and right. and, and it not you know yeah I want to I yeah I think I want to learn a little bit more about the. Uh, about the 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 route you're going down right now, because I, I guess I'd written it down this before. And I, my question um, was uh, was how did people who are considered radicals, and believe me, I know from your book that one of these people changes from radical to something else. But how do radicals like Warmoth and Pinchback um, how how do they end up winning over Longstreet? What do they have to yeah. say? that that would make Longstreet actually uh, not just sort of get on board that, with them politically, and you're going to get to this because you mentioned it, but to lead the military forces that they represent. Yeah, Warmoth is a, is a re Republican governor, union veteran uh, of, of Louisiana, and he wants to try to build a coalition that includes some white Southerners uh, uh, you know, the, essentially the Republican governments during Reconstruction consisted of of white Northerners, most of them Union veterans who had come down to the region. It consisted of Black Southerners, and then it consisted of some white Southerners who were willing to give the Republican Party a chance. Longstreet wasn't the only one, but he's the one who takes the most heat because he is the most prominent ex-Confederate to, 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 to make that commitment. So, um, he sees these men trying to build a coalition. He sees them trying to keep the peace. He sees them trying to promote economic development and modernization, which was something he was interested in generating wealth and profit. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and he, you know, he sees again, the Southern Democrats on the other side forming shadow militias, vigilante groups, groups like the Klan, the so-called White League in Louisiana, trying to trying to create chaos, you know, and 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 strife and division. Uh, and so he sides with the Republicans. He makes a commitment. He doubles down on that commitment. There's a series of street battles in New Orleans where he's leading his interracial militia against some of his own former Confederate troops. They culminate in a very dramatic event on September 14th, 1874, the Battle of Canal Street, where there's literally an attempted coup by white supremacists in, in, uh, in New Orleans, so-called white leagues against the duly elected Republican coalition, governing coalition, and Longstreet defends the state government, you know, is, 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 is was wounded again, the state government falls and then is, is propped back up by federal troops who arrive on the scene. But um, but he 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 really, you know, some, some historians have argued that that he, he was never as radical as he seemed, never as committed to the Republican Party as he seemed. He kind of got out over his skis. Uh, you know, he had many opportunities to back down and he didn't, you know, uh, during during his New Orleans, um, his New Orleans chapter uh, right up until uh, this this clash in 1874. Now, again. You recall something I said earlier, when do Pendleton and Early and these other Lee uh, acolytes begin to attack Longstreet? 1872, 1873, mm -hmm. when he is most visible as a Republican, doing the most he can to promote, among other things, the arming and militarization of, of African-American men. There are Black officers in Longstreet's militia. There are Black generals in Longstreet's militia. Again, all of this anathema to most ex-Confederates. So, um, uh, again, their connections between his politics and his war record. Um, after this, this shock, these shocking events in New Orleans, he he is pretty discouraged, and he will, as you said, sort of three chapters to his life, yet another long street to introduce you to. After mm -hmm. New Orleans, he retreats some, both from the position he had taken politically and from. Um, and, you know, literally from New Orleans, he goes back to Georgia, to Gainesville, Georgia, where he has 
people and family and 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 he's still politically active he's still a republican he still holds patronage positions he still supports black voting um but but uh he is emphasizing more and more as he gets older first of all the need for for white southerners to control the republican party in the region and second of all he begins to sort of reinvent himself as a symbol of reunion between the North mm -hmm. and the South. And he becomes eager to kind of claw back some of his lost popularity among white Southerners and hold himself up as a sort of herald of reunion. The guy who had said, right. you know, long before anyone else realized it, hey, both sides are going to have to make concessions if we're going to come back together as a nation, this sort of thing. And to a very large extent, through that memoir behind you, he succeeds Mm -hmm. in refashioning himself as a kind of symbol of reunion. And th this is, again, all of this complicated story is part of the reason I started the way I did by saying he was more, uh, a more effective communicator, a defender of his own record and politician than people have given him credit for. Right. Hey, I want to slide into the Gainesville period uh, yeah. right now, but I do want to get uh, a, uh, oh gosh, this is gonna. This is gonna be a bit of a trap. As quick as possible. Yeah. Uh, your um, a sort of historiographical opinion about something yeah. that's happening right now. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed about okay, as soon as I finished your book, I picked up a reviewed copy of uh, the fairly new uh, Fergus Bordwich book called Clan War, mm -hmm. and I had also recently read uh, James Hogue, uh, Uncivil War. That's a great and, book of, uh, and, and that I that was very valuable to me as I wrote. Oh mine. yeah, you yeah. used that for yeah. for this yeah. book, especially yeah. the yeah. the military at the military aspects of the battle at, at Canal Street and the other. Yeah, ones. absolutely. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. One of the overarching themes that we're getting from Hogue and Bordwich and and many other Reconstruction writers is that the Civil War and Reconstruction are one conflict. Uh, they are one war, and there are two phases of it yeah. at least and in looking at uh a you can say yeah i like that or it's not such a great approach but b in looking at the life of longstreet do you do you see the possibility of characterizing the conflict he's fighting the war he's fighting as one war from 18 yeah that's a, it's a great question i i get the argument uh, and i'm sympathetic to it that that it's one war, uh, you know, one long war, and that the war doesn't end at Appomattox. That that kind of argument, because if there is, of course, systemic violence uh, in the South after the Civil War, um, you know, uh, perpetrated uh, anti-Black violence perpetrated by by former Confederates. Um, I, at the same time, to me, um, uh, while it, while recognizing the continuity uh, of the theme of violence, the presence of violence uh, 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 across this uh, this period. Um, I, I think uh, that that the military conflict has its own distinct shape um, uh, and and that the the that the the paramilitary violence of the post-war period is 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 something distinct. and that the you know the reason I hesitate to just say it's one long war is that, um, you know, from the perspective of Grant, of African American troops who fought in the USCT regiments, they won the war. You know, and they mm -hmm. and and their view was, you know, they had a right to their victory and to the fruits of their victory, and 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 that victory meant something, and no one should ever be able to take that victory away from them. You know, so I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't think we should minimize Union victory and 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 and. Uh, the sacrifices people made for it and the way that their, their claims, particularly for African-Americans, their claims to citizenship were staked on that on that victory. So so, you know, so I, 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 I but but yes, the 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 absolutely endemic violence. And, you know, a very important point to make about that violence was, was made by the late great historian John Hope Franklin, who, who said, you know, the 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 that this violence of the clan and these groups didn't need reconstruction to uh, as a, as an excuse it was an extension of the violence of slavery uh itself mm -hmm. the violence that uh, upon which the system of slavery uh, depended in a sense and a group like the clan of course comes on the scene in 1866 before black men can vote before congress's plan is in effect it's preemptive violence meant to stop change in its tracks and so that that's uh 
there's a lot of continuity, but I think to have an accurate picture, we need to have both continuity and 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 change in our field. and some distinction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for diverting a a little bit to talk about that. No, no worries. It's a question. Uh, it's a question in front of my mind. Hey, I want to look at for a moment at something that we happen to have that we were thrilled <laughs> that you were able to use. I was and thrilled I could get access to it. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are. Like I said, this is a book signing. You can order the book and we'll send it to you. We are also Abraham Lincoln Book Shop and we deal in rare books and autographs and uh, manuscripts and things like that. And I think this letter that we have here and uh, Elizabeth can tell you some of the details about it, but I think the letter itself as an actual document tells us so much about Longstreet in the Gainesville years. And you only need yeah. to look not even at the writing, but at the letterhead. We're looking at the yeah. Arlington and Piedmont hotels. Uh, why is James Longstreet sitting inside this hotel uh, doing his uh, correspondence with my dear Colonel Owen uh, in New Orleans. And this is a, a letter from November 1st, 1890. And he's writing to his uh, former colleague, Colonel William Owen of the Washington Artillery. And it's a political, it's a political right. letter. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a fascinating letter. I was so glad to find it. So long as I was in Gainesville. You. Yeah. Our friends nice. will want to see that it's actual paper. <laughs> it's actual paper. Yeah. yeah, great, great image there. Longstreet runs a hotel, the Piedmont Hotel in Gainesville, in Gainesville, Georgia. Um, and so 1890, at this point, he's working on his memoirs. He's defending his war record against his critics. Uh, he's again, is still active in the Republican Party. He holds a series of patronage posts as a Republican, as postmaster and U.S. Marshal for Georgia and railroad commissioner and even minister to, to Turkey. Um, but he's writing this former comrade in arms, uh, William Miller Owen, former Confederate uh, in New Orleans. And he's saying to Owen, hey, please consider voting for a Republican. There's a moderate Republican running for office in New Orleans, and, and you ought to give him a chance because he really does have your best interests at heart. And if you'll just give him a chance, things will be better for you. So um, this candidate goes on to, to lose to, to, the, to, to the Democrat. But to me, it was revealing because, first of all, though Longstreet left New Orleans and settled in Georgia, he continued to care about New Orleans, to have friends there and to, and, and to, and to hope you know, that the city would, would, would find peace and prosperity. And, and second of all, you know, he he just, he, he says very famously in an interview at, at, in the immediate aftermath of that Canal Street battle in 1874, the Southerners are their own worst enemy. And, you know, what he means is, why are we making it so hard on ourselves? You know, the, 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 the uh, uh, moderate Republicans, again, with an agenda of, of, uh, of economic modernization and prosperity, if we cast our lot with them, the region would flourish. It would, it would develop. I mean, and part of the backdrop for this is Longstreet had mused. He began to muse during the war, and he mused a lot more after the war about why the North won the war, you know? Uh, and, and, and he concluded it wasn't, it wasn't just the skill of someone like Grant, but that one of the meanings of the North's victory was that a free labor society was a more mighty society, a superior society, and that and that and that Southerners ought to, you know, heed that lesson uh, uh, and and emulate the 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 North's uh, the North's economy. So so he's still in 1890 is you know reaching out to this friend in New Orleans saying, hey, give the Republican Party. A chance and 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 uh, that message, uh, you know, as as the Democrats in this very era are really establishing one party rule over the South that will last for a long time. That message kind of falls on deaf ears, but he's he's he remains very committed to to uh, to to that uh, that that party. Now you've already we've seen his letter, but you've already mentioned his writing, and we need to bring that oh, up yeah. here. Uh, let's take a look at. Longstreet's memoir, which is called From Manassas to Appomattox. Uh, we have a, this is a first edition copy of From Manassas to Appomattox. It's, 
And it's such a beautiful book. Uh, and it, I'm not just trying to pitch the book here. As yeah, a I was to blown. I'd never seen that that cover with the embossing on it. That's quite astounding. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's such a beautifully produced book, such a massive tome and a book. This is Manassas and Appomattox in the first edition. I'm going to put it back because I don't like to wrestle with a big book in front of in front of the camera and all that. And we happen to also have it with the salesman's sample. And when a salesman would bring it to a potential customer, uh, he'd say, do you want to buy it? Here's what it's going to look like. There's uh, examples of the writing inside. And then also examples of the special binding you could get, the publisher's presentation binding. All of this for the purposes of our conversation, that the point I want to have you comment on is it's not just a book from the point of yeah. view of publishers, from the point of view of the public, from the point of view of the people who've been waiting to read yep. what he has to say. The fact that it's that huge, that well-produced, that beautifully produced, it's not just a book. It's going to be something, it's going to be commentary that people want to hear. And so right. what was Longstreet's, what was Longstreet trying to tell people knowing that they wanted to know what he thought. About yeah. That. So, I mean, the, that 690 page memoir published in 1896, the result of a lot of work and study on his part and work in the official records and so on. It is partly an effort to vindicate his military record, to set the record straight about the Civil War. So it is a very detailed narrative of his generalship. There's very little about about his own post-war life, a few, you know, a few revealing pages towards mm -hmm towards the end of uh, end of the book. Um, but but it is uh, the place where he weighs in in some of his strongest language about why the Confederates lost the war. And again, you know, the, the, the context here is this, you know, lost cause mythology, which uh, which was a, 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 a sort of worldview espoused by the jubilarlies of, of, of the world that saw you know, slavery is a benign system. The the Confederacy is as kind of morally and militarily flawless. The Union victory is a victory of might over right. Reconstruction as a as a, a, a as a disaster, and so on. Longstreet rejected the this uh, sort of lost cause ideology, but uh, drifted in the last years of his life towards an alternate, which was a reconciliationism that that focused on on uh, the bravery of men on, on, on both sides. And the memoir represents, in some ways, his desire late in life to try to reconcile his Confederate and Republican identities. You know, um, not an easy thing to do, but, but he, wa he wanted to be, wished he could be both a proud Confederate and a proud Republican. All kinds of people to his left and right were saying, no, it has to be one or the other, um, you know, and, and for some good reason, but, but, but this, this uh, you know, memoir represents his his attempt to try to find some way to harmonize those identities by by celebrating uh, 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 you know reconciliation while also and again there are tensions there and and there it's reflected in the reception while also um, answering his critics and 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 uh, mm -hmm. particularly with with this criticism of Lee as having sort of lost his equipoise and with this praise for Grant as the great military hero of the war in writing in writing the biography did you find the autobiography to present any particular problems i mean you know you have to uh, as a historian you always see an autobiography that one of your subjects is writing as a literary construction it doesn't mean that a lot of it isn't true or factual but they're creating a particular image of themselves and so you have to read between the lines and contextualize and and cross-reference and understand, you know, where there may have been cases of special pleading and whether they're telling something, you know, uh, kind of, you know, relatively straight. So I found it to be, I found it to be uh, useful, but I was particularly interested in the places where he was departing from a kind of dry narrative and where he was, he was expressing opinions, you know, that, that was, okay. that was, uh, yeah. Well, we are about out of time which means uh, according to how these things usually work, we are now getting lots and lots of questions from people that want to <laughs> uh, have their, 
actually. Elizabeth, if you have a moment, I know it's I do, sure. there, I, but sure. we could entertain a couple more questions if you want to. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Okay. Uh, then let's do it. Let's do some shout outs to some of the folks who are watching. Uh, now, I do have a question from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, which I, I think we're probably talking to our friend uh, uh, Daniel Weinberg, who mostly wants commentary on Tom Berenger's beard. Um, and I think probably we'll just let people have their own opinions about yeah, that yeah. particular facial hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not 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 good costume uh, work there in that particular <laughs> Right, right. But I do think that this guy has a pretty sharp looking beard. I like I, I mean, like you know, it's pretty dignified looking. Uh, but let's also I want to give a shout out to a couple of other people that have sent us questions. Uh, Carl Barna wants to know, what did Longstreet think the South should have done better to win the war? And I think uh, Elizabeth has touched on a couple of those uh, answers uh, during the course of our conversation. Uh, Matt Anderson wants to know what was Longstreet's family life like before, during, and after the war. And right. boy, that opens up a whole new. A whole good. New Th those are those are two question. good ones. So, what should should they have done? You know, Longstreet was like Lee. Uh, a guy was like, we, we need to do whatever it takes. And if that means centralization, if that means the government impressing foodstuffs from civilians, uh, for example, uh, uh, impressing enslaved people to force them to work on Confederate fortifications and roads and so on. Uh, you know, Longstreet, Longstreet uh, felt that the, that, the, that the government should have... Um, you know, used a stronger hand to provision the army. His big preoccupation was the just logistical failings of the Confederacy. Is particularly true in his Knoxville campaign, where he just feels his men are, you know, shoeless and coatless and 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 without medical supplies and 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 so on, and that he's been you know put in an impossible position as a result. So the, the logistical woes he sees as human failings, not only by the leadership, but also a failure of the Confederate people to, you know, a, a particularly elites to kind of do what was asked and what was necessary. And he, and he would have been happy to see uh, the Confederate uh, government act a little bit more forcefully to just take what it needed uh, in order to, to support the uh, to, you know, to, to support the army. He also, of course, you know, famously is is sort of attracted to a, a so-called Western concentration block in the Confederate high command people like Beauregard and Johnston who feel that the Eastern theater has been favored at the expense of the Western theater and that if the Confederates at some key moments had, you know, launched new offensives into Kentucky, you tried to relieve the pressure on Vicksburg, um, you know, move troops from the east to the west, they might have been successful uh, doing that. He never becomes a full-fledged member of that Western concentration block, but he does. He does feel that the, you know, uh, um, deployment of resources in those two big theaters of war wasn't always, uh, uh, you know, very very smart. You know, family life. Um, they seemed to have a good marriage to his first wife. They experienced a loss of children repeatedly. Um, but his wife Louise was a was a, a, a daughter of a career soldier and a sort of a, a, a very devoted army wife, willing to make necessary sacrifices. Um, uh, it's heartbreaking for Longstreet when she dies in 1889. Um, but he then marries. This is just you couldn't make this up if you tried. <laughs> he marries in 1897 a Georgia journalist who's 42 years younger than than he is. He's 76, she's 34. Uh, comes under a lot of criticism for that, um, uh, you know, robbing the cradle sort of uh, criticism. Um, he defends the marriage as she does, you know, they, they, they claim to be partners and, and soulmates and so on. And she goes on to have this utterly fascinating career as at first as his defender during his life and, and, and the, the immediate years after he dies. But then in World War II, she becomes a champion of black civil rights in her own way, in a very surprising turnabout of her own. Uh, Helen Dorch Longstreet was her name and, and she's definitely worth reading more about. So two great questions. Yeah, and uh, uh, 
very quickly, did uh, what did the general get behind Helen Dorch Longstreet with some of her uh, some of her own things in her lifetime, or is that something something she moved on to after he died? After he died, he dies in 1904, and she is she's really mostly devoted to defending him and arguing that he ought to be memorialized and commemorated and so on in the South and at, at Gettysburg. She isn't particularly, you know, doesn't show any particular sign of progressivism or whatever we want to call it at the, at the, at the at, you know, uh, in the early 20th century. But, but long about World War II, she really, she really starts speaking out on behalf of civil rights. So, so that's a fascinating journey too. Right. And then finally, Bob Showers has uh, come up with a question that would have been a much better final question than the one that I than the one that I prepared. Uh, so we're going to thank you very much, Bob. And I'm going to go ahead and give you Bob's question and your response to it. And that'll bring us to the end of our uh, conversation. Uh, so Bob asks, I am surprised that Longstreet and maybe any other former Confederate general was involved in politics in Reconstruction. Can you please speak to that? I was obviously under the false impression that their political and military careers were, quote unquote, over. Yeah, so this is sort of the issue, of course. Their military careers, by and large, are over. But, but you know, as early as Appomattox, Grant and Lincoln and the Union are having to think about, will the political rights or the right to vote to hold office of these Confederates be, uh, be uh, restored? And Lincoln proposes a sort of amnesty plan during the war, uh, a restoration of the right to, to, to vote and hold office in exchange for oaths of allegiance. Johnson proposes something similar in May of 1865, Andrew Johnson, but he has a stipulation, a catch, that um, Confederates who are high up in the either Confederate civil government or in the military will have to go to him to get pardons rather than, than just to some kind of lower level magistrate to, to, to take this oath and have their, their, their voting rights and a uh, right to hold office uh, restored. Um, and Johnson uh, then pardons thousands of ex-Confederates, uh, including very high up generals and, and uh, men like Alexander Stevens. So this does permit Confederates to, again to vote uh, and theoretically to hold office. But then when uh, electorates made up of ex-Confederates elect, surprise, surprise, former Confederates to the US Congress, the Republican Congress says, well, no, we can't accept them. What did we fight the war for if these guys are just gonna ride back into power by political means? So Congress implements its own reconstruction plan and we have um, uh, 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 you know, some additional stipulations by, by which one has to, prove loyalty, particularly if you're someone like Longstreet who had taken an oath of allegiance to the U.S. government, broken that oath to serve in the Confederacy, um, then uh, 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 according to the, the you know, 14th Amendment, you couldn't hold office again until uh, Congress had removed that disability by a two-thirds vote. So in 1868, Congress debates whether to remove Longstreet's disability so he can once again vote, and they decide that they should. And, and, and the reason that they do is, is uh, uh, because they believe he's shown repentance. Uh, and, and so it, there is a series of subsequent amnesty acts that remove the last disabilities from the last Confederates who had their voting or office holding obstructed. So um, to a, a, an amazing degree, uh, Confederates' political rights are restored at the end of, of the war. And, and that, and that causes a lot of problems yeah yeah, yeah. and that yeah and then that brings us to you know to bob's question all of these all these guys did have a second act and then long yeah. had a third one and uh and more than half the book is filled with stuff you didn't know that is just as exciting just as interesting and even if you open a long street biography for the fighting well, there's fighting well into 1874. <laughs> and there's a lot of fighting, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me tell you, let me tell everybody what's coming up next on A House Divided. First of all, we wish everybody a wonderful holiday, the Thanksgiving holiday coming up. I don't know if you're going to have a chance to have a Thanksgiving in the UK, Elizabeth. Um, It'll be in the UK this time around, but I'll be back for Christmas. Okay, so. okay. Um, but our next program will be Wednesday, the 29th of November. It'll be 3.30 in the afternoon, Central Time again. 
Timothy B. Smith will be joining us, and he has two books right now. And one of them is Bayou Battles for Vicksburg, which is the next volume in his, what is going to be a five-volume military history of the Vicksburg campaign. Also, The Iron Dice of Battle, Albert Sidney Johnston and the Civil War in the West. And that will be uh, uh, Dr. Tim Smith looking at the controversial and short career of the senior Confederate commander in the West, Albert Sidney Johnston. Again, that is Wednesday, November 29th at 3.30. I am going to send out emails to everybody so that you can pre-order both of the books. We will send you uh, first edition copies with the signed book plates, with this signed book plate that is the same as, this, as the one that Elizabeth Varon has signed for us. Once again, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us from across the sea and talking about uh, Longstreet, the Confederate general who defied the South. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation. I appreciate it a great deal. Sure. And thank you to everybody else who has been watching us. And we will see you next time on A House Divided.